Welcome, everyone. I am so excited for today's webinar. Um, we have Tony Hughes, who will be here talking about sales success in tough times. And if you don't know Tony, Tony is a renowned, world-renowned speaker and author with over 30 years sales experience. Um, I mean, I was shocked to see he had over 500,000 people worldwide that are following his blog. Um, but one thing about Tony, he's the real world of sales. So we have the new world, the old world, he is the real world. Uh, he works with clients such as Salesforce, and actually I believe recently published a book called Combo Prospecting, which we should get to at the end if anyone is interested. But Tony, I know this is something we've been talking about for a while. So happy to have you here, and I know our guests are as well. Sean, thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited about talking with everybody today. Um, we're certainly selling in pretty crazy times. I know the topic of uh, COVID-19 has been done to death. Uh, all of us are sick of hearing about it. Uh, and certainly our prospects are uh, every, anything that turns up in their inbox, which has got COVID-19, I think is destined for the trash uh, before anybody opens anything. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm going to talk about how do we really find a way to break through to people. So I may as well just um, jump in and uh, I just want to talk about uh, some key things that you'll get to take away from today. Um, the first thing is we're going to discuss uh, how do you meet buyer expectations. Uh, then we're going to cover some questions that really transform sales engagement. Uh, and I'm going to provide you courtesy of the sponsor of today's webinar, which is Sales IQ. I need to declare a fact, I'm, I'm co-founder of Sales IQ with my business partner, Luigi Prestonenzi, uh, one of the best sales coaches on the face of the planet uh, as well. Uh, but we're going to give you a free uh, uh, e-learning course with some tools you can download so you can build your own sales success plan. If you're watching this as a seller and you're worried uh, about your own job working remotely, you know, can the boss really see that I'm working even though it's very tough to create opportunity pipeline right now? Uh, this will give you the ability to uh, reverse engineer your own metrics, create a sales success plan that's not words and fluff, Instead of that, it's the language of leaders, it's numbers. We're gonna to, to talk about that today. If you wanna elevate conversations, you need to talk. We all need to talk the language of leaders, which is numbers, outcomes, results, how they can manage their risks in achieving those things. Well, this sales success plan is purely numbers. It's, it's a one, one pager uh, and it'll blow your boss away. Uh, that you're self-motivated, you've identified your numbers uh, and you're out there executing. And then at the end of this, I'm just going to pivot a little bit um, and talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. It's the subject of my next book that's coming out. I'm co-authoring my next book with a gentleman called Justin Michael, who's based in the States. Uh, he's the best SDR, that inside uh, sales role. That person is typically on the phones and LinkedIn and email uh, inside the office, generating leads and opportunities that go to the field sellers. Uh, he's led big teams in this area, and we're writing a book about TQ, Technical Quotient, um, how you create superhuman sales skills. So I'll just pivot and talk about why that's really important, given what's going on in the economy at the moment. So uh, they'll, they will be the key takeaways. Now, believe it or not, it's only about 90 days um, since I was sitting uh, in my lounge room here in Sydney watching the news uh, and on the news was two really bizarre things. Uh, there's always something on, on the news every night bizarre about American politics. Um, but on this occasion, um, and you probably even saw it over there in North America for those watching from that region, uh, where there were in essence riots in supermarkets in Australia with people fighting over rolls of toilet paper. Um, you know, so our version of the zombie apocalypse uh, has arrived was people fighting over toilet paper the next article, uh, sorry, the next item being shown on the news was people lined up around the block uh, in Los Angeles wanting to buy more handguns. <laughs> I guess they were worried about Aussies jumping on the plane and coming over to steal their toilet paper, right? So, but, you know, it's a really, really crazy thing. And you think, what is, what is really going on? Um, what should I do? How, how should I plan? Now, uh, we, we did a webinar with Sales IQ, uh, very similar content to what we're going through today. Uh, back in uh, uh, March, and I said at the time, no one else was saying this, but I said at the time, without doubt, the entire world is now in the Great Recession. Uh, the downstream consequence of the medical emergency is going to be a huge financial crisis. 
Um, in the Australian economy for a long time, we've had in essence a two gear economy. If you're in the mining industry, because Australia is kind of, I guess, similar to Canada in many ways, but more so we're one of the world's biggest quarries where we ship iron ore and uh, even uranium, a lot of precious metals uh, to places like China. And if you're in that industry, you know, it's always been good, the resources industry, but other, other parts of, uh, of the economy, sorry, other parts of the economy would really struggle. Uh, and that's what's happening right now. Um, one of my biggest clients, I'm gonna show you an example in this webinar of how to create a conversation narrative uh, with someone in the most insanely difficult circumstances and how you can still get traction. One of my biggest clients worldwide is Flight Center Travel Group uh, and their business has just stopped. You know, no, no one's booking hotel rooms and flights. We're starting to come out of that now in Australia. Uh, this is being recorded uh, in mid-June 2020. Um, so Australia's starting to come out of lockdown and other places are as well. Uh, but we'll talk about what, what do you really do in an environment like this? Now, the first thing is, um, th th these are stats you can pull off Bombora if you go to their site. Uh, they do a really, really good job in pulling interesting insights out of uh, the enormous amount of big data that's sitting out there in the internet. But one of the first things that happened for anybody in sales as a result of COVID and now in a recession is inbound leads tend to drop away dramatically. So the level of inbound just isn't as strong. Uh, now that means really two things. The first thing that means is we have to get better at responding to inbound and converting a higher percentage of the fewer leads that we get. The next thing is we need to get on our bike and pedal hard in proactively creating uh, uh, our own opportunity pipeline. You know, I often have salespeople say to me, and I work with sellers all around the world, um, London, the States, Canada, Asia, India, um, and I often have people say to me, hey, Tony, look, I, I know how to sell. Um, the only real problem I've got is I just don't have enough pipeline. And I always take a step back <laughs> when I say this because I don't want to get punched. But I, but I smile and say to them, look, I, I know this is not a nice thing to hear, but you know, if you don't have enough pipeline, you can't really say that you know how to sell. Trying to separate those two things is a mistake. If you really knew how to sell, you'd have healthy pipeline. Uh, the best it gets for organizations around the world, um, another one of my large clients is Salesforce, amazing organization. I think they run the best sales and marketing machine on the face of the planet. They do an incredible job enabling their salespeople. But even for a seller at Salesforce, the best it gets, in my view, for most of the people there is maybe 40% of their number is going to come from an inside sales rep giving them leads or the marketing team providing them with MQLs, you know, that they can convert to, a, to an SQL, marketing qualified lead to sales qualified lead. So for most people, they have to go and generate typically anywhere from 60% to 80% of their pipeline they need to self-create. And we're gonna to talk today about how you can do that exactly with some very practical tips. Um, so just remember uh, in good times or tough times, the timeless truths about selling all still apply but there's some things that we need to focus on really strongly and we're going to do that today. So the first thing is, you know, in the beginning of all of this, and if you're selling to a client that's in crisis, maybe you're okay, but you'll have people in your market uh, that, that, that are in crisis. Uh, if it's not this COVID-19 thing, it might be something else in their industry at some other time. But yes, we need empathy. Uh, in the same way, if you get an objection, you need, you need a level of empathy with the person you don't want to argue with people. If people are having a tough time, you absolutely, absolutely need empathy and not fake empathy. It needs to be real empathy. Um, and a lot of people did a lot of this in the beginning of COVID-19. They'd call up their clients and just say, hey, I'm, I'm just checking in. I uh, just want to make sure that you and your team are okay. Is there anything that we can do to help? And that's great. That's awesome. But after about the 13th time that you do that, you know, in a seven week period, you know, it's, it's getting to be too much. People are sick of hearing about COVID-19. There's no value for them in people checking in with them and asking how they're going. Uh, the job of selling, in my view, uh, has always been about making a positive difference in the lives of others. I'll talk about that in a moment. But you need a worthwhile point of view. So one of the things I see when I work with sales organizations is a lot of sellers, especially the ones working remote, and a lot of remote sellers are grooming maybe gaming uh, the metrics by which they're measured within their own CRM. You know, they're closing out leads, they're saying they're doing things. But the truth is, you know, if you follow a seller around for a week, 
the really staggering thing is how, how, how uh, little selling happens in that time. Um, if you really looked at the amount of time we have on the phone talking to people, uh, you know, back in the time that we're all face to face, face to face with people or on a Zoom call with someone that can make a buying decision, it's not that much time in a week for most salespeople. They do a lot of thinking about selling. They do a lot of thinking about prospecting. They do a lot of researching and planning about prospecting, but they don't actually do much of the execution piece. Now, I, I know that's really harsh, but the truth is, uh, human beings are emotional. It's, it's part of how we can bring value, by the way, in the sales process. I'll talk about that at the end and avoid losing our job to the bots. Um, but the reality is we may feel like no one's buying. They're not interested. I don't want to be insensitive. This is not the time to push. Um, but that, that's not the way to be. We, we need to have the right mindset. Uh, my partner, Luigi Prestonenzi, um, is awesome about mindset. You know, we need to set goals. We need the right mindset. We need to create our own success plan. You'll see that at the end. So instead of feeling that it's time to step back, that there was a little window where we needed to step back. It's now time to step up. And the truth is adversity reveals character. Um, what I'm seeing with a lot of sales leaders all around the world at the moment is they're having their own realization about who belongs in their team. They're saying, do you know what? There's, there's always about 20% of the team uh, that shouldn't be here. I'm, I know that sounds brutal, but, but that's, that's the way that leaders think and talk when they're sitting in that boardroom with the door closed uh, or in their private Zoom meeting that they're having. But they're really thinking, you know, who belongs in the team? And the people that just weren't up to what it really takes to sell, you now add a whole level of difficulty that the world is facing right now. Uh, and that exacerbates the situation. So adversity reveals character. It's time to step up. We all need to ask ourselves, what am I going to do in these difficult times, really? What will I do to save both my clients and my colleagues? Because if we get back to what selling is, is really all about, and it's this, you know, selling is not about crushing quota. Um, selling is not about us closing the deal. Uh, selling is not about us making a commission check. Uh, selling has always been about, and you know, t timeless heroes of selling. You know, people like Zig, Zig Ziglar, who passed away in 2012. Uh, you know, had the privilege of of meeting Zig once. You know, and, and he said that if you can help enough people get what they want as a seller or a business person, then you can have what you want. Um, it's about helping other people. It's about making a positive difference in the lives of others, both personally and professionally. Um, and sales success is the fuel, not just for an economy. You know, the, the success of salespeople is what will bring economies out of recession, but it's what funds everybody else in the company that you work for. Uh, now, you know, if someone who develops product will say nothing good happens until we develop a great product. And that's true. <laughs> but, you know, for us on this call, you know, nothing good happens in a business until somebody sells something. You know, it's what keeps all of the people in finance and admin in a role, if we're not selling the product, the people that make the product aren't going to have a role. Um, it's a really important function uh, and it's critically important that we are successful. And you know, the heading on this slide is that intent is everything. Make sure as you, you amp up what you do, as you up your game, that you come across with the right intent and that it's genuine, that you're about breaking through to people because you absolutely believe that you can help them. You can make a positive difference. You can help them improve results in their role. You can help them protect the jobs of their team. I'll actually talk about this a little more. So one of the first big topics I want to cover now that we frame this up is, um, is something that's really interesting. It's so easy for any salesperson right now to think that there's this huge level of apathy with their potential clients that they're, that they're calling on because they're thinking people aren't responding. Um, now, the, the first mistake to make in selling is to confuse being ignored with being rejected. <laughs> but, you know, people are thinking, look, people just aren't interested in change right now. They're, they're saying to me, look, there's a, there's a freeze on all new projects. There's no appetite for new initiatives. Um, we're already working with someone else in this space that's kind of good enough for us. Uh, come back and talk to me in nine months time, for example. Um, but I, I've got to tell you, in the boardrooms, there is no apathy. Uh, don't confuse people not being interested with apathy. Um, what's happening right now is in the boardroom, they're saying, we have to use what's going on. Never let a good crisis go to waste. We have to use what's going on right now to lean the organization down, to drive cost out of the way that we do business. 
Uh, we need to work out how to do that in a way that also improves both employee and customer experience. So how can we concurrently, at the same time, drive cost out while we improve employee and customer experience? How do we do that? Because we need to emerge through this crisis and then through this recession, we need to come into the recession uh, more competitive th than our competition in the marketplace. And the lens through which all of the decision makers are, are looking at your proposal or evaluating the initial conversation you have is they're thinking, what's the commercial value of change? What's the real business case here? And if you can uh, have strong commercial acumen uh, right now, that is the most important thing. It, it's not your ability to friend people and, and have empathy and rapport build. All that does is paint you as a disingenuous salesperson that they need to hang up on uh, or just an email that they need to delete. What they're looking for is someone with a worthwhile point of view and some commercial acumen that can back that up about how they can improve results in their role. So commercial acumen is the new table stakes. Now, there's nothing new about that. We've, you know, for those who read Ch Challenger back in 2012, um, we've got to be very careful with Challenger. You don't want to be uh, the sort of bull in the china shop insulting your clients, pretending you know more than their business than them. But, but the tenant of, of, uh, of Brent Adamson and Matt Dixon's book was bang on. You know, you need to have a worthwhile point of view uh, and you need to be willing to put a little bit of tension into conversations. Remember, people aren't lonely and bored looking for a new friend. They don't lie awake at night hoping a seller is going to call them tomorrow and tell them about the joys and wonders of their product. The thing they're really doing in boardrooms is they're saying, how, how do we consolidate the tech stack in our business? Uh, how do we reduce the numbers of vendors that we're dealing with? How do we get greater value out of the existing relationships we've got? If you're an account manager that's listening to this, there's a clue about the conversations you need to drive. You need to call your clients and say, I am not happy with the level of value that you're getting from the relationship with us. You know, I've got some ideas on, on, on how you could extract more value. Um, when can we find 20 minutes? Because they're all wanting to do that. Um, they'll let go of their best of breed religion around a particular piece of functionality inside a business and say, do you know what? If someone that's an existing supplier can do 85% job with this, that's good enough. That's good enough. So let me talk about, I promised this at the beginning. The first thing is, how do you meet uh, client expectations today? Um, so the first thing is, they're all busy. A lot of them are stressed. And before we've got to ask them even one question, they expect us to already truly know them. So they're thinking, I expect you to know me. And based on knowing me, I expect you to personalize everything. And it needs to be highly relevant. And the last thing is you need to be a mind reader. You need to anticipate of all of the things that you could do for me, you need to anticipate the one or two things that would actually matter to me right now. And I'll just go back to the truly know me thing. They expect us to, to know them at four levels. Know my industry, not yours. <laughs> know my industry as the customer. Know my company or organization. Uh, and, and as a subset of that, know my customers or the markets that I sell to. And then the fourth thing is know me in my role. So truly know me, tailor and personalize and anticipate what would be important to me. I am not interested in wasting my time educating you. What do you think you can do for me and why should I care? Now, people aren't going to be brutally rude and say it that way, but that is what they're thinking. What do you think you can do for me? Why should I care? Uh, and we need to have the right conversation with people. I want to share with you, um, I remember when I started, I had my first selling job when I was uh, 25. Um, I was on the back of, uh, of going to America in my early 20s and setting up my own company. Um, uh, that was a, a big experience in itself. I came back to Australia and decided I needed to go learn how to sell, no matter what I wanted to do in, in business as an entrepreneur. And in my first sales job, I had an amazing sales manager called Keith, who would go out with me once a week and do a ride along and coach me. And I, lo I loved him. He was just such an amazing, amazing um, sales manager. Uh, and he resisted the temptation to jump in and rescue me when I was botching, you know, a sales call. Um, and, you know, we, we'd stop regularly and go grab a coffee and, and we would debrief about, about what I thought happened. And he asked great questions. Remember, people are best motivated for reasons that they discover themselves. If you want them to change, it needs to be decisions that they make, not, not a thing that you tell them. But he talked to me about the conversations and he was my first big epiphany in sales. 
when a lead came to me, the client, potential client or customer was in the mode of comparing us with others. And they wanted to know why we were uniquely different. You know, so, hey, look, I'm looking at your two competitors. Why should I go with you? Now, we've all been taught and it's, it's good advice. You know, don't talk about your competition. Don't say anything negative about your competition. But the truth is this person's making a comparative decision. You know, so I, I developed the phrase to keep things positive. I'd say, well, look, one of the unique things or some of the unique things about the way that we operate are. And then I'd try and talk about our unique points of difference that somehow link to what would matter to them. Now, that's all OK. It's, it's maybe OK. But to take that conversation framework into your outbound prospecting is the world's biggest mistake. And the reason it's the world's biggest mistake is no one cares about you and what you do and how you operate. They don't care about your attributes. They don't care about why you think you're different until they first made the decision that they want to make a change in this area. So the thing we need to lead with is why consider change now? Why change why now? That's what we must lead proactive outbound prospecting conversations with. And even when an inbound lead comes into us, we need to pivot as quickly as we can and ask those questions as well, even though they're in their 99 questions mode about us as a vendor. And one of the key thoughts here is qualify the impact of change rather than trying to qualify the person you're talking to, you know, about whether they can buy. Uh, no potential customer, you know, likes to be qualified by a salesperson and nor do they like, uh, you know, uh, having the Spanish Inquisition with questions, you know, tr trying, you know, tr either educating us or being qualified by us. So just qualify the impact. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually give you now three questions. This is, I think, something I hope you find as a piece of gold in this webinar. Um, if you just get one or two things out of this, it was a worthwhile use of your time. So here's the three questions. When a lead comes to you, the very first thing you say to them is you say, hey, Mary, absolutely, I'm happy to answer the 1,374 questions that you've got in that spreadsheet that you want me to fill out and send back with our price. But do you mind if I ask, what's happened inside the business that's caused you to look at this now? Now, so many people say, yeah, yeah I get it. Hey, Mary, you know, what's happened inside your business to, to want to buy from Salesforce, you know, or from whatever the company is that you work for? That's not the question. Right? That previous question is a salesperson's question. You want to ask a business question. What's happened in your business that's caused you to want to look at this right now? And if they go, well, I'm not sure why you'd even ask. Say, look, I'm just trying to understand what the business case would be. Because uh, I, I work with a lot of people in your role to help them not just buy, but also implement successfully. And it's really important that you fund this at the correct level, you know, as a, depending on what you're selling, you know, but it's a change management program. And I just, want to, I just want to understand what the business case is um, to help you make sure that this gets approved and funded and that you manage your risks. Um, so, you know, what, what improved results would you expect for the organization, you know, and for you and your role? So if you were going to invest in this with us or anybody else, what improved results would you expect to get, you know, both for the overall organization and for you and your role? Um, and the reason these questions are so important is you're, you're identifying what was the trigger event that went on, so in, on inside this organization? Who's typically going to be involved? What's the business case going to look like? You know, where is the commercial value of change? Because the thing that all of the research has found in the last 10, 12 years, when they've looked at win-loss win reviews, is the number one reason that the customer will go with you rather than somebody else. If you're selling enterprise style of solutions, the number one reason is not, is not product market fit. It's not price, it's not brand. The number one reason is the engagement experience they had in working with you and your team. Um, because at the end of the day, they sit around their boardroom table saying, do you know what? There's, there's three vendors on the short list that can all do the job, but this one took the time to understand us uh, they understand what we're trying to achieve. We feel they're going to be the right cultural fit in working with our team. We just feel that this company gives us the best shot of actually delivering on the promises we're making internally on this, that it will get adopted and will achieve the results. Um, and then th that brings you to the third question, which is where do you see the risks? So what's happened inside the organization that's caused you to look at this? What improved results do you expect for the organization and for yourself? And where do you see the risks? And the reason these questions are so important is a lot of people focus on qualification frameworks. Uh, if you're in simple transactional selling, you might've heard of BANTS. You know, does the person have budget, authority, need? Is, is there a timeline? You know, that's the B-A-N-T acronym. 
Uh, there's medic, if you're in the tech sales, there's a whole lot of these. But the truth is, it's the degree of engagement that you get with the person that determines whether you're going to win the deal. Uh, and the information flow needs to be two way. It's them giving us access to information and other people that determines the probability of winning. So we need to get really good at asking the right questions. Okay, so that's something on, on inbound uh, and trying to, to uh, change the agenda in the conversation. Let's talk about creating the right conversations when you're driving outbound. So when you're driving outbound. Now, the key thought here is um, most objections in the top of the funnel, so that you get objections when you're trying to progress and close a deal, when you've been working with the client for a while, uh, I won't talk about those, but you also get objections in top of funnel. Um, and an objection, you know, could look like someone just giving you the brush off. It could be a legitimate concern. Um, and we need to obviously go a little bit deeper with objections. But my experience is that most objections in top of funnel when you're prospecting, most of them are self-created. We create our own objections in the way that we engage. If you sound like a low level pesky salesperson, then you're, you're going to get some, <laughs> some, some brush off objections because they don't want another salesperson in their life. But we can also anticipate the real objections. And I'm going to give you real examples of this. But you know, if we think about the world of our customer, we can anticipate you know, what their pushback would typically be. And the key thought is make their excuse the very reason why they should actually speak with us. Now, let me just provide you with a, a conversation framework that I, I use with organizations all over the world. Um, I've had sellers be very resistant to this, um, but then they, they, they email me or call me or email me and say, man, the results I'm getting are just staggering. Um, so the first thing is anybody who neglects the phone in sales is guilty of sales malpractice. Um, uh, selling uh, can be a profession. Uh, a lot of salespeople I look at don't act like professionals at all. Um, you know, they don't maintain their system of record, you know, in their CRM. Uh, they, don't, they don't have an agenda for meetings. That they, they, they don't take notes. <laughs> if you put them on the spot on how they respond to something, they stumble and fumble, you know, in, in trying to answer it. Um, you know, if you jumped on an airplane and the pilot said, hey, look, I love flying. I just don't, I'm just not into all of the paperwork, you know, with logbooks. You know, I'd be getting off the plane, right? Or if a doctor said, hey, Tony, do, do you want me to fill in my patient record system or do you want me to diagnose you and give you a script? You know, which one? You know, I'd say you're a professional. I expect you to do both. And it's the same with sellers. So this framework really works. And there's some basic rules here. The first rule is, is we need to be brief. Um, leaders want us to be brief and be gone, right? That's the first thing they're thinking. What do you want? And then get out of my life, <laughs> right? I'm not after a long rambling conversation. I'm busy. Um, so we need to be brief. So uh, this is the framework. You introduce yourself briefly. You know, hey, Mike, it's Tony from Sales IQ. Uh, and then you warm the call by referencing either a common relationship, a trigger event you noticed, or playing back an attribute uh, that you discovered in your pragmatic research. You don't need to do 90 minutes of research to contact the prospect. You can do it, you know, within 30 seconds. You go have a look at their LinkedIn profile, the last thing they published. You look at their website. Um, you know, there's some big announcement they've made or a new CEO just joined, right? But you, you need to show them that you know them and you need to do it quickly, right? So, uh, so hey, Mike, it's Tony from Sales IQ. Hey, I'm um, Kian McLaughlin thought it would be a good idea for you and I to have a conversation. And that's it. Now, if this person knows Kian McLaughlin, if that's a common trusted relationship, I've basically got my meeting. I, I, don't, I don't need to wrap it on about anything else, right? Or, uh, hey, hey, Mike, I, I noticed the company just launched a new product. Um, the reason for the call is I've got some ideas on how I think you could, right? And in a way that, and then what you put here is a double-edged in essence, in essence benefit statement. But what I call it is a worthwhile point of view about how they can improve results in their role, right? So um, for, for Luigi and I at Sales IQ, um, you know, in essence, you know, we do sales enablement. If I was calling a sales manager, it'd be, uh, hey, 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 Sean, um, Kian McLaughlin suggested I give you a call. Um, hey, look, I've actually got some ideas on how you can get more of your reps hitting quota and in a way that gives you an accurate forecast you can trust that you're giving to the board. Um, so I'd make those potentially the two things, right? If I was talking to a marketing manager, hey, I've got, I've got some ideas on how you can drive more MQLs out of your existing marketing spend and in a way where you get a higher conversion rate with the sales force. Um, uh, have you got just 15 minutes now or when can we find 20 minutes later in the week? 
And then if they go, well, look, I need to know more, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd say, sure, it's, it's, about, it's about you being able to hold your salespeople to account for self-generating pipeline. Hey, Sean, do, do you mind if I ask, what does it cost you per lead at the moment for inbound? Right, so this is how the conversation goes. It's really short, right? So introduce yourself briefly, but don't give them the history of the company. Don't talk about, you know, what the company does, just who you are, where you're from. Warm it up with a common relationship, a trigger event you noticed or an attribute that you've noticed about them. Show them that you know them. Try and start with trust. Referrals start with trust. Trigger events start with context. If you can combine the two together, it's gold. And then you say, look, I've, I've got some ideas on how I think you could, not how we could, how you could make them the hero of the story, not us. And in a way that gives them the second real benefit. Remember, it's not a benefit unless it's a result for them. Don't confuse attributes about us or things that they could do as benefits. It needs to be a real result they can measure. Uh, dollars, percentages, that's the language of leaders. And then if they go, look, I need to know more, be ready to go deeper without talking about your company or product. And then, and then, and then just ask a question, right? Have your questions ready to go. So that's actually the framework. Now, let me just give you an example. Um, this is Flight Center Travel Group. Uh, one of my biggest clients globally, work with them all around the world, including in Canada, where, where you're from, Sean. But you imagine what happened to them in March in COVID, when COVID-19 hit and the world stopped traveling. Uh, this is their entire business. You know, they're not like a distillery that could pivot from making gin to making, you know, uh, hand sanitizer. Um, they, they were just basically dead in the water. But what they said is, this, we need to find a way to engage with clients so that when the world re-emerges with travel, we've taken market share from competition. Again, the way leaders think, we want to emerge from this stronger. So I work with their leadership team and they've given me permission to share this, but what we, what we came up with is this, we can anticipate the objection. And by the way, we didn't have to, they told me what the objection was. They said our account managers are calling clients and the clients are saying, hey, uh, Wendy, there is no point in meeting, no one's traveling inside our business, come back and see me when the airlines are back in the air. And what we said is, well, let's make that excuse the reason. So this is how their conversation went. They call someone up. Uh, hey, hey, John, uh, it's, 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 it's Mary from Corporate Traveller. Um, with no one traveling right now, this is the perfect time for you to look at your travel policy and the way that you manage travel as a process so that when people come back to travel, they do it in a way where you have driven 8 to 12% of cost out of what's typically the third biggest expense line on your P&L in normal times, and in a way where you've got far less duty of care risk with your staff. And you know what? You've got no change management issues right now because no one's traveling. They're not going to complain about how the process is being changed. Uh, and you've got the bandwidth in your finance and admin team. When can we make time to have a look at this? And they've had amazing engagement with clients. So they've made They've made the excuse the reason. They've made the excuse the reason. Uh, and that's what all of us need, need, need to do. I just want to now change topics and talk about how do you take control of sales stress? Because in selling during tough times, it is, in, it is incredibly stressful. Um, it's, you, it's, you know, you're dealing with high levels of rejection. People are less open to conversations. We have to up our game. Um, even feeling a bit isolated, it's harder to stay self-motivated if you're working from home. I know for me, I just feel like I spend 14 hours a day in front of computer screens. You know, that, that in of itself is tougher. Um, this is actually a picture of me back in 2008 when I was sales director for a public company uh, in Sydney. Uh, and I've got to confess to you, uh, every quarter, because this was a quarterly driven business, every quarter I felt like I aged a whole year of my life. Uh, and the reason I aged a whole year of my life is my sales team. Now, by the way, I was the leader, so this is all my fault, but the sales team uh, didn't have enough uh, quality sales pipeline. And it felt like we were doing unnatural acts, you know, every quarter at the end of every quarter, trying to drag business forward and get stuff closed, just like massively stressful, ma massively stressful. Um, and, uh, all of us need to manage our stress and stress will literally kill you. Just want to share with you um, that about 18 months ago, I do a lot of cycling and there's a regular ride I do in Sydney and there's a very big climb in it. And despite riding more and more and losing some weight to get healthier, I was actually going slower up this climb and I decided to go, I decided to go get checked out. Um, and they did a con and I, I can ride a hundred kilometers on a bike, right? So you'd think I'm reasonably fit. 
but they did a contrast dye uh, CT scan of my heart or MRI, I forget what it was of my heart that imaged up my heart. I got the report back and it said I had the cardiological age of 86 and I had uh, a number of blockages in my heart, one at 60%. So I booked myself in for angioplasty where they go, they go up your uh, arm with a camera and they can, if they need to, they can stent you. Long story short, uh, I got stented. I was 99% blocked and a hair's breadth away from dead uh, in what they call the widow maker part of the heart. And I look back on my life and um, just always being on all the time and just being hugely stressed, you know, is the thing that causes all of this. Uh, you can see uh, that, that after image, all of those shriveled up arteries are extended. But he, here's the thing. How do you reduce your stress? Because it, it can literally kill you. Uh, it's no way to live. We need to love what we do, not, not be stressed out about it. The thing that creates stress is not feeling in control. It's not the size of the quota. It's not the amount of work you've got to do. It's just, I, I just feel out of control. I don't feel in control of what I'm doing. And the way that you can take control is to make sure that you have your own sales success plan and you've identified all of the metrics. And this is the gift um, that we're going to give you today. This is free for you. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll email out to everybody on the agenda a link uh, where you can do a Selling During Tough Times course. There's a recording of this version of the webinar from back in March. But there's also a place on the web page where you land where you can log in to create your own credentials. It's all free and you can do the um, sales success plan module within the sales IQ platform. Um, and uh, you'll get an Excel spreadsheet. The, the e-learning course only takes about 15 minutes to do. But I'll explain how to fill in this Excel spreadsheet where you talk about uh, uh, your quota, average deal size, cycle times, conversion rates. Uh, and then what it'll identify for you is how many outbound sequences, what I call a combo, phone, voicemail, email. If you just do one thing, if you just phone or you just email, it's easy for it to get ignored. But if you combine these things together and concurrently drive multi-channel outreach, you pattern interrupt people ignoring you. And then what you can do as a result of creating that Excel sheet is you'll also be able to download this one page PowerPoint deck. So it's just one slide where you can represent your metrics and give it to your boss. So if, you know, if I use the reality um, TV show uh, metaphor, if you want to be the last one to get booted off the island, you know, it's the one that's creating pipeline, you know, that's, that's going to be okay. Obviously, you've got to convert pipeline to revenue. But if someone's creating staggering pipeline in tough times, no one's going to get rid of that person, in my view. Um, so this is your sales success plan that's full of numbers, the language of leaders, you know, rather than words and waffle. Um, this is what really gets the attention of leaders. Last thing I want to talk about is this. Um, there's always an unintended consequence of action, <laughs> and there's often unanticipated consequences when something big happens. Uh, a lot of people are saying that we're going to bounce back out of this recession fast and hard. Um, I don't believe that's the case. I think for many parts of the economy, this, the lingering effects are going to be tough for quite a period of time. Um, but there's something that's going on. It's been going on for a long time, but it's now accelerating and it's invisible. Uh, and, and that's the way that technology and automation is replacing humans. And we've seen this in the blue collar world, you know, in manufacturing for a very long time. Um, back office roles are being automated away already. Uh, professions that you think would be okay, like law and finance and accounting, uh, a lot of those roles are going away. If you think even in law firms, people would, would study and look at precedent to provide advice you know, to potential clients. Um, there's AI and algorithms go and figure out the probability of a, a legal case being won or lost you know, without a person having to really do hardly anything at all. So uh, artificial intelligence and tech and platforms and apps and big data is absolutely going to disrupt lots of jobs. And my view, is that at least 20% of business to business selling jobs are at risk. Um, did you know already today, 85% of transacting in the B2B world happens without any human intervention. Now that's not the process of winning a new client, I know, but the truth is um, clients don't get value out of a relationship with us. Um, we need to move away from the friending approach in opening to instead having a worthwhile point of view that's backed by some commercial acumen. Uh, where we become the trusted advisor 
by taking a genuinely consultative approach to how we sell. So it's really important in your own sales career right now, as you think of adapting, um, because the truth for most sellers is average deal size is shrinking and yet their sales quota is increasing. Sales cycle times are actually blowing out as people are be wanting more and more consensus in their organization to decide if they're going to do something. You go, man, how, how the hell does that work for a seller? If deals are getting smaller, cycle times are getting longer, quotas are getting bigger, I'm going to run out of hours in the day to be successful. And hey, I've got to self-generate most of my pipeline. The, the way that you do this is you develop TQ, technical quotient. You make it your superpower. You work out how you can become like Iron Man, which, you know, you, you and your Java suit. It's man and machine. Um, and let me just talk about a couple of things you need to be aware of, and I'll wrap up on this. So... We all need good IQ. You can't be dumb in life and be successful. <laughs> you need EQ, especially in sales. You're dealing with huge amounts of pressure and stress. You've got to be good at understanding yourself, playing to your strengths, managing your weakness, reading other people well. So IQ and EQ has been timelessly important, but add to that today the need for TQ, technical quotient. Most salespeople, if I say to them, hey, can you just show me how you use Sales Navigator? Show me how you use Sales Navigator and save searches to monitor for trigger events. Show me how you'd use Sales Navigator uh, to go and book a dozen meetings in a, in, in a city if you were going to go there in two weeks' time. And they fumble around in the dark, right? And yet they claim they're a professional. We need to use our tech. So here's the thing. Machines are really good at filtering big data, doing what-if um, analysis, pattern matching, making recommendations. You know, that's what eBay and Amazon is all about, uh, automating back office tasks. And you know what, for sellers, you can even use tech to automate trigger events, right? Those things that go on in the marketplace that give you context for conversations, insanely powerful. You can use tech to do that. So you need to leverage technology for all of those things. Embrace your CRM, work out how to create your own reports, automate as much as you can. Be an expert with the technology that you need to use. You know, some salespeople I call, you get some bizarre automated response from their, from their telco when you call their cell. You know, at the sound of the tone, your message will be turned into a text. You know, you think, is this even the person I was trying to get hold of? And say, yeah, I don't know how to change that, right? You're a professional. Learn how to use your tech. And then leverage the things that make you truly humanly powerful. Um, so empathy and insight, creating emotional connection, navigating the politics in an organization and helping them build a business case. We can be really creative. Machines will never do that. We can help our clients secure consensus inside their organization. Humans are good at dealing with ambiguity. So think, how do I mesh the truly human things with technology to up my game and make me indispensable inside my own organization? Last thing I'll just say is this, you know, we're going to look back on what happened, you know, back in March at some stage and laugh. Um, we're going to get back into meeting in boardrooms uh, and hotel, you know, bars, uh, sales kickoffs, conferences, um, you know, and, and we'll be laughing at this, but we won't be laughing if we're not being successful. So in the same way that the CEO of your customer is saying, don't let a crisis go to waste, do the same for yourself. This is the time to lean into the way that you use technology. It's incredibly important. And with that, I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen uh, and we'll just move to Q&A. Remember, all of these free things are available for you. Uh, thanks to Sales IQ who's sponsoring. And uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and over to a conversation. Perfect. Well, Tony, thank you so much for everything. I have to say, I've done a lot of webinars in my time and I've never had a webinar where not one person left during the webinar. So we had every attendee that joined stayed the entire time. So I want to thank you so much, guys. Um, also, guys, start asking your questions. Um, any questions you guys have, it looks like Lorraine asked one, but start asking some questions. We'll, we'll take some Q&A. I know there's some of the stuff that Tony was mentioning that, you know, me personally and our team um, have really been working on was, you know, one, the consolidation of sales stacks. And um, during, during this turbulent time, you know, more of a consolidative selling, trying to not only helping people with maybe the product or service you're selling, but help them with anything that you can help them with just so you can be there for them. Um, so a lot of the stuff uh, um, Tony said really did resonate with us. Um, so we have a question from Lorraine. One of the things we've struggled with at our organization is coming up with those insights about how our software solution increases productivity and efficiency and lower the risk of quantifiable ways to speak to leaders in their language. Any advice on how to uncover these kinds of tangible metrics? 
That's a really great question and thanks for asking it. Um, one of the things that's really neglected by salespeople uh, is, is understanding your existing customers. Yep. So the first thing you want to do as a salesperson is, is say to your boss, um, t who, who are our 12 best customers? Now, if you're selling into a vertical, make it who's the 12 best customers in that vertical. Uh, and if you can go and meet them and, and have a look at the case study. Now, the problem is the case studies that get published say almost nothing. Um, and that's often the client's fault. You know, they, they, they don't want to say that they were screwing things up and running their business badly. And now this is all improved. They don't want to, they don't want to embarrass themselves or tip their hand to competition. So published case studies say very little, but go, go to the account manager or customer success person that looks after that relationship and get them to go ask the question. They need to go to the customer and say, Hey, when you guys went with us three and a half years ago, you would have done so on the basis that you put up some kind of business case internally to, to justify the change and the investment in working with us. What was in the business case? What improved results were promised to the executive team in going with us as a supplier? And has that been delivered? Because if it hasn't, we, we want to work closer with you to make sure that it does get delivered. And what happens is you find out about trigger events because trigger events give you context in what goes on in the world that makes people interested very early before a lead ever comes in about what it is that you would do. But you also find out about the business case. So that'll equip you to have a much better conversation and it'll give you a clue about what you need to talk about. Now, when you talk about, you know, we help people be more of, I think you said efficient and, and effective and with lower risk, th that's all great, but it's so high level, it's a cliche. So, you know, what you need to do. So again, if I look at what, what, Louis and I do with Sales IQ, right? We're building what we regard as the world's best sales enablement platform, where we build methodology together with e-learning, with best practice with adult learning embedded, with live coaches. We think those three things help move the needle. What we do is we don't talk about that. We don't say, how hey, I'm from Sales IQ, we've got an e-learning platform. No one wants an e-learning platform, right? That, that, that's not what they want. What they want is more reps making quota. <laughs> they want you know, higher conversion rates on qualified deals. They want an accurate forecast. They want people having four times pipeline coverage, right? They're the things they want. So we talk about that. So, you know, we say, you know, uh, hey, hey, Mike, I've got some ideas and hey, get more of your reps hitting target, right? And in a way where you can hold them to account for self-generating pipeline. Have you got just 15 minutes now? We don't talk about our product or what we do. Right? Make them beg you to know what you do. And I go, well, how would I do that? Well, it's, a, it's around a strategy of, of you being able to leverage the best methodology in the world for creating pipe uh, and in a way where they can learn how to do it and you can hold them to account without you having to fly them somewhere for training. Do you, do you mind if I ask, you know, what does is, what is an inbound lead cost you right now? <laughs> right, because if their inbound lead cost them, you know, $178 a lead or something, like you're starting to see what the business case is for investing in e-learning, if they can self-generate. Um, or how many of your reps are on target year to date right now? You know, what, 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 what does it cost you every time you turn over a rep in lost revenue and direct cost, right? You're starting to find out the business case behind it. So long answer, but the thing is <laughs> truly understand your clients and the trigger events in the business case that got them working with you and then make that the conversation. And the really good thing is when, when the leader you're talking to says, well, you know, well, who else have you done this for? Uh, you can talk about that really credibly as well. Perfect. Uh, Mark's asking, what motivational book do you recommend or books? Um, I recommend my own, which is combo prospecting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if, so this conversation is really, really about top of funnel. Um, the three best books in the world, actually, I'm going to go the four best books in the world on prospecting of these. Um, there's my own combo prospecting that's done really well. There's predictable prospecting from Mary Lou Tyler, which is really good. Um, there's fanatical prospecting from Jeb Blunt, which is a phenomenal book. It's awesome. And then the fourth book I'd recommend is from Anthony Ian Marino. He's, uh, he lives in Chicago. It's a book called Eat Their Lunch. Um, and his premise is that today in winning a deal is typically always about displacing competition. Um, that's normally what the deal is all about. And he's got some, some, some great advice on that. So, so, so they're probably the four best books that I would recommend. If, if you're a sales manager, um, I would recommend this book by, by, by Jason Jordan, Cracking the Sales Management Code. Uh, it's, it's a really great book if you're a sales manager. So they're, they're the ones I'd, I'd recommend if you're wanting to drive 
top of funnel. And the best way to stay motivated is have a plan you're executing so you're not stressed um, and make sure you're successful. Perfect. Um, we have what, uh, what are some of the top you know, sales softwares out there, Tony? And how about you, Sean? Uh, do you want to go first, Sean? Well, um, you know, sales software, obviously, uh, AutoClose um, is a sales engagement platform. So we do help companies fill the top of the sales funnel. Um, and we do have a B2B database inside our platform. So we have both kind of under one umbrella. Um, but um, I don't want to be too biased, but I'll let Tony answer uh, some that he's come uh, Salesforce, I'm sure, is one. But what other sales platforms would you say? Yeah, so so auto close honestly for everybody is an awesome product, right? So you definitely need you definitely need auto close. The other two things you have to have in selling, or the other three things you have to have in selling. The, the first thing is a, a smartphone, right? <laughs> so yeah. we all know that you need that, right? So the next thing you need is a CRM. You absolutely need a CRM and stop using it like a manage up. Like I'm going to manage the expectations. I'm going to manage up and provide a forecast um, tool and instead use it as a way of enabling process. CRM properly implemented enables process. If you're not enabling sales process with a CRM, then you, then you don't have accurate data, which makes the thing next to useless, right? So you've got to enable process. So obviously Salesforce is the best sales, uh, sales CRM out there, but so, so CRM is really important. And then the other tool I'd recommend. So the fourth thing is a phone, auto close, a CRM system. The fourth thing is LinkedIn sales navigator. 100%. If, you're in, if you're in B2B selling, it, it's in essence, your database um, and learn how to use it properly. L learn how to create these great Boolean searches in their wizard that they've got to monitor for trigger events and to filter down to find the people that you need to find and to do pragmatic research, research in seconds, not minutes. So you can drive the level of outbound you need to. Yeah. And one thing I would, I would add to Tony is, you know, as Tony mentioned is you, you need to have more than one channel. So you need the social selling, you need the phone, you might need the email, you might even need SMS. And, uh, and LinkedIn is a great way to build, as Tony said, that trust, especially during a turbulent time. It's a great way to build uh, trust. It looks like we'll take one more question here. We have Ross. Thank you for a great presentation, Tony. What are your thoughts on no cost trials or pilots? Or pilots. These are challenging times, but I'm not 100% comfortable in providing my potential customers with our service and solution for free. Our solution has intrinsic value, and my feeling is there needs to be a value associated with our value proposition. What are your thoughts on that? It's another great question. These have all been really good questions. So um, I've, I've had most of my professional life selling software. I used to be the, the managing director for APAC for a good Canadian company, OpenText. <laughs> yeah. So I've sold, I've sold big complex enterprise software. So I'm not quite sure the level of complexity in your software. So um, just filter what I'm saying based on the level of complexity in your software. Because if it's a really simple thing that solves a, a problem powerfully and it all looks easy and wonderful, then a demo can be okay or trial can be okay. But here's my view. If you sell complex software, you take your life into your hands every time you do a demo. I hate trials and pilots. Anyone who demos to create, to create interest uh, or allows the client to do pilots and trials is a bit of a sand pit and a, a way for the client just to have a look and a play. Um, I, I think is a crazy person. So there's so much risk whenever you demo product. The danger is uh, you show so much, it all looks a bit confusing. Uh, they think, oh, I don't need the Rolls Royce. You know, I, I just need the Chevy, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so you don't to look too complex. The different buyer personas that you sell to in the process will want to see different things. It's hard if you lose control to manage that thing well. So I would just generally avoid demos and pilots and trials as a way of creating interest if what you sell is complex um, and it, whenever you do a demo trial or pilot you always want to negotiate and trade these concessions if you're going to invest in doing this for them we need to understand what their buying process looks like so how do they define this being successful or not and then what happens as the next step so just just do that dance with the people if you need to do it but if, if what you sell is amazingly beautiful and sexy and simple you know when they do the pilot and they go wow we've got to have this then fine but my experience is that's very rare perfect well if anyone has any other further questions um feel free to ask him we'll, we'll send them over to tony so he can answer them also we are going to have everything here recorded we'll put it on youtube it'll be on our website um and also i know tony's going to want to send you that uh, that free checklist for you guys as well um tony i want to thank you so much for waking up very early in Australia to do this for everybody today. 
Um, I think we still have almost everyone here that is still listening. So um, thank you so much. And, um, and if, if the audience wants, we'll definitely um, do this again. Yeah, and if and if you, if you like these concepts, everything I know about selling, uh, especially around this t t top of funnel piece, is all on Sales IQ. So just go to salesiqglobal.com. So it's all there if you want to learn this. It's really affordable. Uh, and then the other thing is, please keep an eye out for my new book, co-authored with Justin Michael. Next year it'll be out in uh, summer next year from Harper Collins called TQ Superhuman Sales Skills. So thank you so much for having me on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.